Okay, well, we're going to talk uh, talk about residual and regional anomalies. Uh, we're looking at an anomaly here. This uh, You could think of this as the uh, total Bouguer anomaly, you know, with all the corrections made, the plate and the terrain, or it could be a simple Bouguer anomaly. Uh, if you, you know, if the terrain was not uh, significant, and you, but, but at any rate, this would be your final processed uh, gravity data that that, that you have collected and uh, plotted up across along a transect through your area, and um, so you're, you know, you can see that this is obviously a lot more complicated than the anomaly associated with a, a buried sphere. You've got lots, lots going on here. There are a couple things that you should be able to see. One is that the anomaly, on average, tends to increase through the area. And then there are these shorter wavelength uh, variations superimposed on top of this um, <clears throat> longer wavelength um, feature. And uh, so there may be different, uh, you know, there, there may dif be different sources. What the uh, shorter wavelength anomalies may be due to some shallow geology and the longer wavelength feature to deeper geology. So let's take a look at um, the regional and the residual and, and the total Bouguer gravity. Uh, we're, we'll assume that the longer wavelength component that we see in here, this gradual increase from left to right across the length of the profile here, is, is linear. And uh, in Excel, you could just get in and fit a trend line to the data points here. And so this would be our regional component. It increases uh, over this three kilometer distance from zero to six milligals. And we remove that. We subtract this um, zero to six milligal trend from the anomaly. And we get what we refer to as the residual. <clears throat> So in this case, the, the longer wavelength, in this case a linear feature, would be could be due to um, deeper sources. Uh, and the shallower ones, um, the shorter wavelength ones, are also likely to be due to shallower uh, sources. They're, they have a shorter wavelength. Uh, they can only be associated with objects that are so at some maximum depth. So, so we've taken this original anomaly here, we've separated out a regional and a residual component for this anomaly, which we can analyze separately. Now Mark Stewart wrote a paper about uh, gravity surveys over buried valleys. These are um, glacial valleys. Uh, the last episode of continental glaciation scoured out a lot of um, uh, the bedrock in this area, so you have uh, bedrock, and on top of that, you have a lot of uh, glacial fill uh, filling up the valley. So you can't really tell where these valleys are by looking at the surface. The topography at the surface is fairly subdued. Uh, but you know, just looking at uh, the data that he collected over here and contoured up, you can see that. Over here on this end, we've got minus 12.5 milligals, 10 milligals, 7.5 milligals, 5 milligals, right in here, minus 2.5, 0. So we have this regional trend. Now, he's he, he, he knows something about the geology. He knows that this regional trend is associated with deeper... Um, <clears throat> um, kind of a, a deeper, uh, higher density unit, which is, is dropping off to the, uh, to the left here. And so he separates out the regional component, uh, which has this shape. And you can see that it goes from about minus 12.5 milligals up to 0, up to 2.5. So this is the total anomaly, the, the anomaly, the processed values, the processed data that you've contoured up, that you collected in this uh, area, and this is the regional that you've extracted. So we're going to take the regional, subtract it 
from the total Bouguer anomaly in order to get the residual. Now, for Stewart's purposes, the residual is providing information about the location of buried glacial valleys. And he's interested in groundwater exploration, so these deeper valleys, we can see these lows in here uh, and over here, these are going to be areas where you might want to put a water well so to tap in the water that's uh, collected in the deeper uh, deeper parts of the glacial valley system. And um, so we'll, we'll just take a look at a transect here, uh, a cross section through the area which he put together, which shows sh some of the um, subsurface geology in the area. Um, <clears throat> He's interested in these valleys. He subtracted the, you know, by computing the regional component and subtracting it from the total, he's gotten a residual, which he thinks for the most part is associated with the variations in the depth to between the, a drift, which has a density of about 2.6 grams per cubic centimeter, and uh, the deeper rocks, which on average he, he assigns a value of about 2.6 grams per cubic centimeter. You can see that those densities are not not the same. There, there's some variation in the density of the deeper strata, but he uses this in order to help him make an initial uh, kind of a general interpretation of the data. How deep are the valleys? We'll, we'll assume a simple uh, density contrast uh, <clears throat> in order to, to get a feeling for uh, what depths were talking about. So, uh, another another thing that he, he does, if you look at the residual back here, it has both positive and, and negative values, as, as does our residual over here. Right? In other words, we can see the anomaly go above zero, below zero, back and forth. And the whole flip on down here again. Uh, he assumes a simple density contrast of negative 0 0.6 grams per cubic centimeter. So in order to, to get this relationship here that the valley depth is equal to 130 times the anomaly, uh, the residual anomaly, he needs to have all the anomalies shifted down into the negative. He's got this negative density contrast that he's assuming. If he has a, you know, if he just uses the anomaly with both positive and negative valleys, he's going to have bedrock over his head in some places and down beneath his feet in others. So, since bedrock really doesn't uh, poke out of the surface in this area, uh, this is a good way to to kind of transform the data just to shift it so that it kind of meets his expectations. Okay, so that that's you know that his paper would be a good paper to to reference and take a look at. It's only about seven pages, so it's a quick read. Uh, we're going to talk uh, for a few minutes about the graphical separation of the residual. Uh, you know, looking at this would just be another approach. He takes a more uh, quantitative approach to calculating the residual, and I I'd, I'd refer you to the paper for details of his discussion. But if we just take a uh, kind of a crude uh, contour map here and um, think about, we, we can obviously see that there are two things going on. There's a regional drop from about a minus 11.5 to 20.5 milligauss through the area, but then superimposed on top of that, there's another feature, which we would assume would be uh, you know, associated with a shallower object. It's a shorter wavelength. Um, so, in order to do a graphical separation of the re residual, we're kind of interested to extract this anomaly from, separate it out from this total field. The way we go about doing this graphically is we kind of assume that this object just wasn't there. Uh, we just extend these contour lines from right to left, across or left to right, across the area. And then we look at the intersection points of individual contours with these lines. So this line here would be uh, some minus 17 
Milligal contour line, the, the regional. You know, just thinking of this as a regional that goes through the area. If this was not here at all, uh, then this would be minus 17, minus 17.5, minus 18. And we just see this kind of step ladder of contour lines uh, uh, going through the area. And so we look at their intersections and we say, okay, here's the regional. You know, if this anomaly wasn't here, the contours would just simply go unperturbed uh, left to right across the area. And, but we're looking, we see that that's not the case, and we're looking at the intersection of these contour lines with the regional. We see that 18.5 is minus 0.5 relative to the regional. That over here, 18.5 is minus 1 relative to the regional, minus 17.5, and so on. So we, what we do is we draw these lines through here. We label all the intersections. And uh, again, relative to the regional, minus 17, minus 17.5, minus 18, the values relative to the regional. And again, this 18.5 contour line that we see in the actual data intersects the minus 18 milligal contour at this point and has a value which is a negative 0 0.5 milligals relative to the regional contour line of minus 18. So we do that for all the points and we get you know these values at all the intersections here and then we contour them up. And you can see that we have a re residual anomaly here which has a circular shape and some things that might come to mind would be that this could be a spherically shaped object or that we might approximate it as a buried sphere of density contrast. The anomaly is also negative, so we know that the object producing this anomaly has a negative, relative negative density compared to the surrounding strata. So we're going we're gonna to come back and talk about this um, and evaluate this residual anomaly. So we're just going to use uh, the tools that we already have. You know, we've talked about simple geometrical objects. We've talked about the uh, uh, how to analyze the uh, uh, anomaly associated with the buried sphere. And we're going to we're going to take a look and interpret this uh, uh, residual anomaly and, and learn a little bit more about what it might represent, what the density contrast are, what the depth is, and uh, the radius of, of this object, assuming that it's a sphere. So we'll talk uh, more about that next time. See you then.